For decades, he drove around some of the most important men in the mob world, including Jimmy Hoffa. Little did they know, one day he would become an important police informant. Hi, I'm Rebecca Brayton and welcome to WatchMojo.com. And today we're speaking with journalist Adrian Humphreys and Marvin Elkin, better known as The Weasel, about Jimmy Hoffa and his current whereabouts. Now, tell us how you ended up in New York as Jimmy Hoffa's driver. So I got a job as a busboy at the Copacabana, famous nightclub in New York, owned actually at that time by Mr. Lou Walters, Barbara Walters' father. And in order to uh, work at the Copacabana, you had to be a member of the Teamsters. This was very easy, when you joined up. And uh, a group of Mr. Hoffa's associates used to come in there quite often. The staff were scared to serve them because they were tough guys and they tried to act it. They, they did, shouting and yelling. But I knew they weren't gonna do anything and they were big tippers. So when they came in, I, other people would run from them, I didn't, I ran to them. After I was there a few months, one day they called me over. They said, it was a Wednesday. They said, Friday's your last day here. We spoke to Lou Walters, Friday's your last day. I got quite upset. I said, well, why? I'm trying so hard to do a good job. They said, yeah, but as of Monday, you're Hoffa's driver. I said, I'm what? They said, you were going to be Hoffa's driver as of Monday. I said, well, I don't want to be Hoffa's driver. So the Salerno said to me, nobody's asking you. And what did you learn as his driver? Mr. Hoffa was not the way the world in history take him out to be. He wasn't. He wasn't really a gangster. He was a tough guy, fearless man, really wanted to do well for his union, and no question about it, he brought the mafia in. He made a deal with Don Vito Genovese to, because he needed muscle on the picket lines. And the deal was when he didn't need them, they would leave. When that time came, they told him to go jump in the lake. So uh, he did bring them in and he got involved with them. But he really wasn't a, uh, he really wasn't a gangster. One of the things that sort of uh, threw me a little bit was Don Vito. Don Vito spoke to you like he was your grandfather or your favorite uncle. Very nice, very soft. Sometimes we'd be driving and Mr. Hoffa would yell at me because I made, he didn't like the turn I made, that's no big deal. And uh, Don Vito used to say to him, uh, Jimmy, why are you yelling at the boy? He's doing a good job. And I used to say to myself, the world is crazy. They're nuts. They got this guy all wrong. Something's wrong here. And one day, he asked him, he said, Mr. He said to Mr. Hoffa, he says, Jimmy, this uh, guy, this manufacturer, clothing manufacturer, he's cooperating, right? And Mr. Hoffa said, no, he's not. Don Vito said, well, he's got to go. Next day, they found the guy dead. So that's when I said to myself, uh, I don't care how this old guy talks, this is a guy you don't fool around with. Tell us a bit about the role and the importance of the informant and how you became an informant. For a very complicated uh, circumstance, he, he had a cataclysmic uh, confrontation. He was, he was uh, seized upon by uh, this this uh, detective constable who was a tremendous handler. And a handler is the uh, police jargon for the primary police contact for a street informant who, who was pushing or encouraging Marv to, uh, to work as an informant. Marv didn't really have any interest in doing that but thought he'd uh, play along, see what he could get from them. Uh, but then he was involved in a, in, in a scam where the gangsters were giving him all, making him take all the risk, but giving him the smallest part of the profit. And he got so angry with them, he says, I know how long I can get back at them. I, I can hurt them without making a fist. I'll sell them to the coppers. And he soon found that he was a far better fink than he ever was a crook. And 
and, and thank goodness for the rest of society that was the case because over the next 30 years he, he engaged in a remarkable array of, of, of capers and undercover operations with the FBI, with the RCMP, with the uh, Ontario Provincial Police, with city police all over, uh, police forces in three continents um, to, uh, to, to trap spies, mercenaries, drug traffickers, mobsters, conmen, fraudsters, uh, pedophiles, pornographers, uh, the list goes on. Um, quite a remarkable array of, uh, of cases that uh, both Marv was able to tell me about, but also I was able to uh, confirm through the police agencies and the retired police officers I interviewed, and also the police notes that I managed to, uh, to secure. Now, in my research, I found that you claim to know where Jimmy Hoffa is. Mr. Hoffa is in the concrete, in the cornerstone of the Renaissance Center Hotel in Detroit, Michigan. They were getting ready to build the hotel. Mr. Hoffa goes missing. And the next day, all hell broke loose to pour concrete. They did everything to make sure I never saw concrete pour it so quick in my life. The director of the FBI was on TV once. Larry King asked him where he he says, we're not sure, but we think the Canadian driver is probably right. After this happened, but I had thought of that before, there was a, uh, a big meeting held at a hotel across the road from the Renaissance called the Omni. The head of the meeting was the head of the Detroit Mafia, Tony Giacalone. For a break, it was, when it was over, they said, let's have a little break, we'll have breakfast. The meeting was over after three days. Let's go across to the Renaissance and have breakfast there. So we all did. And as we crossed the dividing line from the Omni to the Renaissance, Mr. Tony Giacalone says, say good morning to Mr. Hoffa, boys. 13 years I've been uh, debriefing Marvin. I've never caught him in a lie yet. I'm still looking. So don't you think I haven't stopped looking. Keep going. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. Hey, great interview. Thank you very much. Thank you.